Thank you. Well, enough of the easy math. Uh, let's get down to something more difficult. No. <laughs> uh, my name is Jim Vallandingham. Um, and like she said, uh, my day job is at a biomedical research facility for doing uh, genomic analysis on worms and flies and other sciencey stuff. But uh, for fun, uh, we, I like to look at uh, data visualizations and, and interactive ones. And today I'd like to uh, talk about the, the force layout in a little bit more detail and, and how to uh, use it in, in a non-traditional manner. So, um, so we're going to be abusing the force layout. Typically, here's a, here's a you know, we just saw uh, an example of your traditional force layout. And you, this is typically utilized for your social network or your Congress's uh, voting on the same stuff, you know, network-based stuff. Um, but we're going to abuse this force a little bit and come up with some novel ways to apply it uh, to other data visualization techniques to make uh, your life a little bit easier. So first, I just wanted to get everybody on the baseline of what, what exactly, what we're talking about when we mean the force layout. Um, and I think, you know, for most people, I would agree that uh, with the right amount of nodes in your, with the right amount of bubbles in your layout, um, it's a pleasing way, it's a pretty way to draw a graph. Um, and, but it works underneath the covers, it's working as a physical simulation. So each of these nodes is kind of a, a charged force, a charged particle, excuse me, and uh, they have... Uh, these charges work to, to move, to repulse, or to attract them in different ways. And the links between these nodes constrain that movement. And the simulation works as a giant loop. So uh, each iteration, each cycle of this loop, uh, the charges are, uh, are Im impact the nodes, they move, and the visual display is updated. And that looping just occurs over and over again until it settles into a stable configuration. Um, so that's, that's the force layout in a nutshell. That's, that's how it traditionally works. I'm a big fan of this concept that everything is a remix, uh, which I first kind of latched onto from Kirby Ferguson's uh, wonderful uh, videos, which you haven't seen. Uh, put it in your headphones now and, and start listening to them. Ignore me. Uh, but his, his main thesis is that um, in the art, in the creative world, uh, new works are created by simple modifications of existing work. So you take, you take some existing stuff, you copy it, you transform it, you combine it uh, to create new pieces. And his, his videos are about that occurring in the arts, in music, and in uh, literature and, and movies. But I think that is also true, and I think we've seen this in a number of presentations, uh, also true in the data visualization world. So part of this talk, I'd like to provide some remixable components uh, little nuggets of, of useful, you know, trickery that, that we could start thinking about uh, applying to uh, your own visualizations. So that means we're going to look at some code, and hopefully that's not a terrible mistake. Um, so let's start with the force layout, but let's start out with just looking at just the nodes. So let's build up this first part. We'll build up a simple node layout in D3. Uh, D3 is a, a powerful tool for this because uh, I think we'll see the the uh, succinctness that you can write and start using the force laid out immediately. And l the chances are you'll probably be using D3 and your other stuff, so it's a good uh, that it has that in, in the toolkit that you could use. Um, so like everything in D3, uh, the nodes are going to be represented by some data. So here we have uh, just our, our basic data set. It's an array of objects, and each object has some attributes. Here we just have the, um, the amount attribute. To get a force layout started, it's pretty easy. You create a new instance of the force layout. You pass in your data, your nodes, um, as the nodes parameter, and then you start it. And then um, we'll talk about this here in a second. You, but you also want to listen to the tick event. And that, as we'll see, allows you access to the simulation at each iteration, at each loop of that simulation. Um, an important thing to remember about D3 in, in general and, and the force layout in, in particular uh, is that you're not constrained by a particular rep visual representation, right? That's one of the big powers of the, of the whole idea. But that does mean you'll have to do a little bit of extra work to get things going. 
So a couple more pieces of, of, of code. Uh, first, you would have to, you have to decide what, how you want to visualize your uh, force layout. So you have to visualize your simulation. So on these, we'll just use some SVG circles. Uh, but really, you know, keep in mind that that could be anything. And we'll see a, a couple of examples of other stuff. And right now, uh, so yeah, so you, you bind your data, uh, in this case, the force nodes, to, to that visual representation. And right now, we won't use any attributes of that, that data. We'll just use some static constant for the radius. Now, inside, uh, when the force layout starts, you get um, your data attributes get injected with some variables or some more attributes uh, if they weren't already present. And specifically, we'll look at the X and Y attribute that will get added to each element of your uh, data array. And these represent the current uh, position of that, of the node be being represented by that um, visual at every iteration of the uh, layout. So you can use that to position your, um, your nodes. And so this is the tick function. This is the, the simplest example of the tick function. This will get called, executed every iteration of the simulation. And we can use the X and Y from being provided by our, our force layout um, update to m modify the positions of the circles that, that, that we're using to represent it. So with all that, you get a, you get a couple of circles, right? Uh, but you can uh, already see that this is a nice uh, visual uh, attractive uh, thing. And it, it only took a few lines of code to do this. So what, what's going on behind the scenes to help make this attractive are, are the forces that we mentioned that are working on each of these nodes. I'd like to talk about briefly uh, charge and gravity. Charge, uh, if I get my guy up, charge represents um, the, the repulsion or attraction between each node and every other node. So um, uh, more negative values cause the nodes to repulse from one another and, more, and less negative and positive values cause them to attract. Um, so you already can make cool stuff like that. Um, gravity, unlike physical gravity, it's not down to earth, it's, it's more of a, I mean, it's described as a physical, a spring, spring-like thing attached to the center of the visualization. So uh, higher gravity constrains it to the center, and if you let go of gravity, you, everything floats out into space. So with all, uh, just this, this uh, beginner introduction knowledge to the layout, you can start to abuse the force in our own, in our own way. Um, and the first abuse can be uh, the example that uh, Irene was talking about, uh, the, the bubble chart. And this was first, or one of the first, uh, you know, best ways this was shown was a New York Times uh, visualization that was looking at the Obama uh, budget proposal. And so I'm using the, you know, term budget uh, bubble chart just to rep mean we're using the, the node size to represent some underlying data value. So how would, how would we, might we be able to implement this uh, type of visualization using the, the knowledge that we have about our force layout? Well, the first thing is easy. We can, instead of using some static constant for our radius, we can scale the size of our bubbles by uh, the data that it's representing, you know, that we want it to represent. Um, and that gets us half the way there. Uh, but unfortunately, everything's overlapping. Nothing looks good anymore. So what do we do? The, the insight is that we can pass a function to our charge parameter. It doesn't have to be constrained by a static constant either. And so you can use, so this, this now function will get executed for each node in your layout um, at the start of the uh, force, uh, at that start uh, time. And so we can use the data itself to scale um, our, our charge, our repulsion value by this, the amount that it's being visualized. And with those two changes, we get this nice uh, uh, effect, right? Each node is, is pushing away relative to uh, its size, and the sizes are then scaled by the data that you're looking for. So it works pretty nice. Um, and this is my, this is the, the summation of the whole talk. So study it. Uh, I think Mike Bostock 
uh, said it very eloquently when he said the force layout is an implicit way to do position encoding. I'm going to remix that quote slightly and say it's a lazy way to move nodes around. But it's, it's a good kind of lazy. So um, as we'll see in these, in these other examples, we're, we don't have to care about uh, each individual location of, that, of, of the nodes. We instead impose simple rules in our simulation, right? And allow the nodes to find the correct positions based on our simple rule set that we're giving them. Uh, here we're just using the, the charge, the simple rule that charge is relative to size, and, uh, and that's all it takes. So how else could we abuse this concept of uh, applying simple forces? Uh, yeah, it's cute, right? <laughs> I like the Darth Vader as the evilest character in, in, in the book, you know, the movie. Uh, well, the, the original one here uh, had this cool feature where uh, you could split apart nodes based on some categorical value. So here it's mandatory versus discretionary spending. Which brings us to the idea of uh, imposing our, our own, or apply, uh, imposing our own custom forces onto the, the nodes. So I recreated um, parts of the, the New York Times one uh, visualization in this uh, demo for the, for the blog post about, uh, this is Gates spending, so the Gates Foundation, um, sorry the title's cut off, but uh, and their, the, the grant sizes that they've provided over the years. So in, in this, the, categor the categorical splitting we can do is over years. And so you can see, you get this really nice organic uh, feeling and they can, they can merge back together. So it's pretty uh, and it's useful. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, here's our, our basic tick function. The whole, the whole general idea of custom uh, forces in, in this in this example is we can modify this slightly to add in a, a first a you know a function that jacks with your nodes somehow and modifies the the in position slightly and then use that uh, to then that modified position to then uh, position our nodes um, so here's an example uh, and we won't go through all the code but um, in this, we would have some, some way to represent the two centers that we want. To, we're going to split up uh, nodes from left to right. And uh, we grab, we have a function called move towards center, you know, category center. Um, and this, this is a function that returns a function, and we'll see why here in a minute. Um, but so we grab uh, the, correct, the correct center for our particular node's value. Remember, this is going to get executed each for each node, um, and then move move that node based on the center's location. So that almost works. Uh, here's our our nodes. When we when we apply that custom force, uh, we're back to everything slamming on top of one another. So what's going on? We, we've lost that a uh, nice thing that I just said was the whole point of this talk was that we didn't have to care about stuff. Now it seems like we'd have to care about every position all this stuff. Um, fortunately, we have this this access to this uh, parameter, which is which is indicated as alpha, um, and we can think of it as a blending parameter uh, that can be used to combine multiple forces or charges on these nodes. And if we, it's accessible from the um, force instance, but you can also get to it from from the tick function at each iteration inside of an event uh, that's passed there. And if we were to print those out, we can see that it starts around 0.1 and gets decremented slightly every iteration of the every loop of that of that simulation. And then when it ends, um, it, what, when it gets to a, close to 0.05, it'll end. So the numbers are ar arbitrary, but the idea is that this is the actual uh, mechanism by by which the force layout is is settling down into. I mean, it's. It can be considered a form of simulated annealing if, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but, but this is what's causing the, the stabilization of the force layout in general. So we can use this parameter. And here's the same code, but instead of, uh, so here now we get to pass in a, uh, the alpha into our, into our move toward category centers. 
And with that small tweak, this is why this is why it's a function returning to function is because so it allows us to pass in variables uh, without creating a global variable. We can pass them locally in here and ha have access to them in our in our closure down here. Um, but with that small tweak, things now work as you expect. Now we, we're again not uh, here when we separate them out. The the it, the alpha blending allows our charges that are now relative to the, the size of the nodes to be blended with our custom force and um, works with a lot of nodes and it works if you uh, drag them around they'll they'll stick to their centers but again we're not we're not worried really about where each of these nodes goes we're just telling them you guys clump here you guys clump here and they figure things out it's kind of nice um, so Let's look at another iteration of this. Uh, right now, the uh, the repulsion, the charge that's that's uh, associated with each of these nodes is nice. It keeps the the nodes away from one another, but it it's kind of an eventual process, right? Uh, so, what if you wanted that to be a more constrained, more formal looking uh, distinction? Um, well, you we can implement a real simple collision detection in the same manner. So this was done, I like remixing New York Times graphics. Uh, and by remix, you know what I mean. But, <laughs> uh, but this was done by another great piece where th we're visualizing uh, the words, different words said at the different uh, national conventions during the uh, elections. And uh, I, I implemented again some parts of this in another visualization that just looks at uh, word frequencies in, in some books. But the, the point of it is that now um, when we move these guys around, uh, the, there's a nice hard line around uh, each of them. They're, they're colliding and they're, and they're um, maintaining that uh, parameter around them. To implement this, um, it's the same, same idea. Um, we, we use another uh, modification function. We can call it collide. And I'll just look at, we'll just look at pseudocode here. Because um, it's not difficult, but it's a little long. So again, this is being executed for each node um, at every cycle of that, that physical simulation, that, the node layout. So we just, inside of this, we can loop through all the other nodes and then do a, a simple distance check. If, uh, if they're too close based on the, the values, uh, the, the data attributes that we already know in, in, those, in those nodes, then we just move them back by half. Um, and so we get that, uh, with that slight modification, we can get this nice look. It works with other custom uh, forces, like the one we just looked at, and it works with any number of nodes that you put into it. And this, this is a, a brute force mechanism that, that you can optimize, but it's just a starting point for this kind of uh, visualization. And you can do cool stuff, like the, the demo of putting an invisible node underneath your, your mouse cursor, and then everything, all your other uh, little nodes are afraid of it, which is fun, too. <laughs> OK. Oh, yeah, oh, one more. And uh, there's nothing that mandates that you have to move them back by half. So if you, you start increasing that, that movement, you can end up with this nice uh, but useless popcorn explosion. <laughs> they're colliding with one another and getting scared and running away. Just fun. Um, OK, so let's, I think this is Dragon Ball Z, not really uh, Star Wars, but that's OK. It's a force. Uh, let's add some, some links, you know, finally. Um, we've, links constrain the locations. Uh, that our nodes can move around. Um, oh yeah, here's, here's the example with the links now. And as you might expect in D3, links are also represented in data. So the minimum two things you need in your link data are a source and a target, which represent the two uh, nodes that they're connecting with. You can do this either via an index into the nodes array or with the actual nodes themselves. And if you do it in an index, when the force layout starts, they'll be translated into the nodes themselves, which means you have access to uh, both the source and target node data. Um, you need to visualize them in some way if you, if you so choose, and so we can draw a simple line in this example. And then, like I said, you have access to the source and destination 
or source and target uh, data, and you can use their X and Y coordinates to position your lines start and stop. And so you end up some, the simplest uh, example I could come up with is that. Uh, forces also have their own, uh, links also have their own parameters. I'd like to talk about just link distance. And um, as you might guess, link distance just specifies the uh, link distance, the length of the, the, length of the links um, uh, based on some value. So uh, another insight is you can make that link distance driven by data. So instead of being a constant, it can, it, it can, be, uh, it can represent some data value. In this, in this case, the link uh, data has some value distance that you could use to, to expand or contract each link at a per link level. And that's essentially all I've done in this particular visualization where I was looking at um, uh, communities in neighborhoods that have a sharp racial divide. So here, this is Kansas City, and each, each uh, node is now represented by a census tract. And like I said, you don't, you're not constrained by bubbles. Um, and, underneath, and so each census tract is connected to its neighbors by links, and invisible links. And this isn't, hasn't started yet. But the length of those links is relative to the proportion uh, of white and black populations between that that neighbor and its neighbor, you know that that census tract and its neighbor. So um, if there's a sharp uh, jump in in white or black populations, so if you go from one census tract is 20% white to its neighbor being 20% uh, black, then then that length will be longer. So when we start this, it it starts to break apart at areas where there's this real high division, and and I just, I would, uh, this is something that you understand kind of uh, the, the emotionally in Kansas City, but you, I wanted to kind of look at a, a way to represent how these um, uh, racial boundaries affected the, 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 the spatially very small areas in which they occur. So um, there's that. So, but that's all, but underlying that we're just uh, link distance is the only trick on that. So we can start expanding uh, these concepts. Um, and the first, the first thing I thought of when um, I kind of discovered the multiple centers idea is what if you put it into a circle, you know? Everybody likes circles. So here's my interactive hairball that I did for uh, uh, my, the, the people that I work with or work for at Stowers. They wanted just kind of a, an artsy representation of collaboration. You know, one of the main science things is everybody collaborates with one another. So each of these, each of these groups is a lab. Each node, each circle is an individual in that lab, and there's links between them based on how many papers they're on together. Um, so it's fun, and, and it allows for exploration. Again, all I'm defining are the, uh, the, cir the centers along a circle, right, uh, for each lab uh, not the individuals, which means we can do stuff like reordering the um, the circle's center locations makes everything move around. You know, kind of fun. You can you can change, and if you change the uh, the uh, uh, radius that you're applying the circle to, you can make pretty but useless. You know, obviously artistic uh, spiral of spiral of collaboration. <laughs> but you get to find out who's who's the coolest kid in the. In the, uh, in the groups there. Um, and if, if you want, you know, uh, a little bit of math introduction, I kind of feel embarrassed for needing these kind of reminders after that previous talk, but Tom McWright has a great introduction to this uh, math for pictures, which I think is a, is a wonderful uh, introduction to using, uh, using this kind of math to generate circles and stuff. Another example uh, from a website called Let's Free Congress that was used as kind of an extension uh, of, of the idea that um, they're looking at the small number of people that contribute large amounts of money to, uh, to election funding. Um, but the, the visual was kind of interesting, and I thought I'd recreate it. So you start out with a bunch of nodes. I kind of wanted Kill Bill music to be playing at this, so that's why the color scheme is such. 
Um, and as the center node expands, the, uh, the nodes around it are kind of repulsed uh, kind of in a very organic manner, right? I, I, I like it. And then when you come back down, and they all jump on. Um, but this is, is trivial now that we know um, the, the previous examples here is all building on it. So we can tell this is uh, the collision detection is, is in, in effect here. Um, but it's also just a modification of the, um, the charge, right, uh, for that center node. So you get, get a value from your slider uh, and then modify your charge function to utilize that value. And um, that's all you need to do to create this kind of uh, interesting visual with, with, again, not much work. The last one I'd like to look into in depth is, uh, is a, a kind of a deviation from Moritz uh, Stefaner. Um, and it's called, he's got a GitHub repository called Grid Experiments. And the idea is um, you start out with a grid here represented by these, these dots that are kind of hard to see. Um, but when we apply a force layout diagram, uh, in this case it's just random data, but they, they, have to, uh, uh, they have to follow two rules. One, they need to stay on, on a grid spot, and two, um, no two nodes can stay on the same grid spot. So when you start it up, uh, I think it, it creates these kind of very interesting looking um, patterns, and, and uh, you can modify the the uh, the uh, shape of your grid underline here's here's more of a just rectangle grid, and you can see that they kind of move, you know you know there's a little tweaking that goes on as it, as it sits there, and the reason behind that is uh, there's actually two nodes associated with each of uh, with each of these points the the um, the visual one. And then this underlying one that's still getting manipulated by the other forces in effect. So you have these two parameters, uh, or these two rules, and then, and then the, still the charge and the constraints are being applied to, uh, to these nodes. So I, I was, the first thing I thought when I saw this was, was you know, subway maps and transit maps. So I kind of wanted to create that for Kansas City. So here's uh, Kansas City's subways. Works pretty good, right? I mean, <laughs> no, we don't have, we don't have. I was further inspired to, and by that I mean easy access to data, uh, when Fathom did this, this very similar experiment with the, the Boston uh, subway systems here. So Fathom has a great post in about how much geography can we get rid of in, in transit maps and still, you know, it's, a, it's a, just a thought process. But I really liked the, the visual display here. So I thought I'd retry it with, uh, with this simple, more, you know, a simple, they didn't really define the algorithm that they, they used to, to create that uh, visual. But now that we know the, the algorithm here, so we'll start, start each node, which is the uh, subway station. We'll start them at their geographic, you know, physical location. And then we'll let the simulation run and see what happens. And it's interesting. Uh, I think it's kind of artistic and, and fun. I don't know about the practical, you know, being able to read this. I'm, I'm not from Boston, so it just doesn't matter to me. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it's a, I mean, it's at least a starting point. It's something to, to conjure up more ideas, and, and I look forward to seeing some of those. Um, I've got three more quick examples of, of, of these same principles being applied in, in, in the real world. Uh, the first one is, uh, an older site, but is Barack Obama the president? Dot com from uh, the the Guardian, right? Uh, these the the balloons themselves are uh, are being controlled by a force layout, so they have a, a you know a buoyancy kind of concept that are making them float. And then if you were to hover over one of them, you get the same radius expanding concept to to a lesser degree that kind of pushes and focuses in on one uh, one one balloon. I also have. I like this one, uh, it's The Shape of My Library by uh, Sarah Groff Palomaro, a UX de designer, I probably butchered her name, in San Francisco. I, I thought it was interesting as a, so she's quantifying or, or making note of, of her library, her books that she contains. And it's, it's a simple concept again. Uh, we're just using the same idea as multiple center points, but now with a lot more of them. 
but it allows for starting to quantify these different categories in an, in an intuitive way. You know, the larger bubble groups is, means a larger number of books there. And this, again, is part of a larger interaction that can be moved around and, and modified um, and explored. And finally, uh, Discuss is a recent uh, kind of dashboard they call it Gravity, wherein each of these, each of these um, white nodes represents a, a topic, and uh, the, the bubbles that start forming around it are uh, comments and conversations around those topics. And the, the more interesting part is that this is real time and it, and it gets updated while you watch it, but, but it's the same effect, really. The uh, nodes themselves are part of a force layout, and each of the uh, nodes in a particular uh, category are being drawn organically to, to the center, which happens to be the, the uh, topic node. And so, you know, with a, a little bit of uh, work, they're allowed, they're allowed to have all this flexibility uh, from by just defining these, these simple rule sets. So hopefully we've seen a little bit behind the magic of the force, right? This is Frank Oz, you know, controlling Yoda. I didn't, I, it's cool. And uh, um, that was, you know, I mean point is to take away some of the magic behind this. I think it's important that um, we get to see the, the how of, of some of these, you know, visualizations that we were inspired by. And, and try to break them down into little components that we can then uh, abuse ourselves. So I look forward to your abuses, and um, thanks. Um, huh? You can take questions. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. You have questions? Been. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think some of these are again starting points of of where the yeah that you can start encoding um, more. You can start applying more simple rules to these to to make them more finesse. Um, but I, I have seen examples of, where, are you talking about like X and Y being, being part of the... Yeah, yeah. And, and some of these, I mean, there's, yeah. So we're seeing examples where, well, in the uh, Obama, the, the first one here, I, I, one that I didn't talk about, but something that also makes it, uh, let's see if I can get to it. Something that makes it cool is... Uh, that they're they're actually double encoding their um, the color. Da, 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 da. Let me get to it. There, um, color shows the amount of cut increase, right? It says, but it, that is kind of also double encoded by it, the the layer that it's in. So I I really like that they're they're adding that nuance I didn't talk about, but so in this. I guess the the why is you know at least uh, helping that that um, that separation by keeping things layered and the uh, implementation of it is you just add another uh, custom force and and I cut it out for time but the nuance is that they they have the they've multiplied by alpha twice for that particular force so the uh, effect, the impact of, of the tiering is less than the impact of the separation. So you, you end up, you can blend them to your own discretion how much you want uh, one to affect you know, the other if you want them both equal or whatever. I thought that was a nice, maybe, a, maybe an example of where this is starting to occur. Mm -hmm. 
the more distantly related groups could be actually physically more distantly apart. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, and in, in my, my hairball, uh, those links aren't impacting the, the locations of the nodes. But, but yeah, it's certainly a, an, an easy optimization to that would to, to, be, to make them the order of those nodes more meaningful. And that's, the reordering was, was an attempt at that. But yeah, utilizing the data, the, the data inherent in that, in that data set would be a much more powerful way to, to uh, start looking at that process. Uh, well, I think it's depending on the technology. Like we've seen, um, this thing can bog down after in, in SVG after a couple hundred uh, nodes, and it it certainly seems. I'm not an expert, but it seems to be dependent on the browser you're looking at too. I mean, uh, I I'm doing this in Chrome for a reason. You know, most of these wouldn't fly as well in at least earlier iterations of Firefox and some of the other browsers. Um, I know. There have been experiments in using Canvas, and I think the, the performance can be improved after you get a certain hit to a certain threshold. Um, but I might be incorrect about that. Uh, Bostock has a, a uh, example of comparing SVG and, and Canvas implementations of not the force layout, but of a bunch of nodes moving around. And they, uh, he was, I mean, they, they do work in a similar efficiency at, at, at certain at numbers, but at certain numbers. But. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jim.